Welcome to the Drum History Podcast. I'm your host, Bart Vanderzee, and today we're joined by Thomas Antoine in France. Thomas, welcome to the show. Thank you, Bart, and Happy New Year. Happy New Year. It's, it's great to have you here. This is, um, there's, there's certain shows that are very uh, unique because they're more like scientific and they're more, um, they're about drumming, but they're, they're really a little different than the, the average um, you know, show about the history of a company. So um, yeah, so today we're talking about the history of acoustics um, and really how it relates to drums and, um, and all that good stuff, which you have a background in and are kind of an expert on acoustics. So um, that being said, why don't we hop right in and you teach us uh, the amazing history of acoustics. Okay. Well, thank you uh, for for hosting me on on this uh, show, Bart. And um, yeah, I have prepared some 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 uh, some kind of timeline uh, talking about the uh, the history of acoustics, and and uh, you'll th- you'll see by the end that that it it's really um, related to to the history of drums. It begins at the same time in history, and the latest development are are really contemporary. So for, as our instrument is. So um, when you take a look at, at, the, at, the, at the global history, our history starts the 6th century BC. And uh, the ancient Greeks, and, and namely uh, Pythagoras, uh, noticed that the set of st- some set of strings with rational length ratio uh, would lead to pleasant sound. Mm-hmm. This was probably the first connection between uh, an observation of, of a sound perception and uh, uh, math and, 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 and the geometry and the length of, of strings and things like that. And then later on, um, Aristotle, two, two, two century after, um, concluded that the sound would be about motion of air and there was you know, a link between sound and motion. Hmm. And, and then... Um, Third century BC, some academics assumed at the time that the sound would propagate, propagate like a wave with whatever perception we could have at the wave of a wave at the time, which would be a ripple on the on the on the top of a water surface on which you in which you, you throw a stone, you know. And then uh, probably for for wider structure, the the the, the history of of uh, archi- architectural acoustics starts in. 3000 BC with the Epidevros theater, you know, and, and this theater happened to have the right slope, the right spacing of benches and the right orientation and everything and the, and the wall so that, you know, the sound of, of, uh, of an actor could be heard from the stage to 60 meters away hmm. and which was with, with an excellent intelligibility, which was awesome at the time and still is now, you know. Sure. Now, can I ask, did they... N- probably a dumb question but that was on purpose right like the position of the seats all of this stuff was at that point they had kind of figured out a little bit about um maybe started writing down like okay this is where you put things to hear it or sound will bounce like this like that was clearly done on purpose correct well this is tri- still being a research it, it, it's probably uh, by accident or a try and error thing but for sure this theater this epidavros theater had all the, the good characteristics so that the, the ancient Greeks would say, okay, now we have this, uh, this uh, geometry, this, this layout of theater, and we're mm. going to copy past all around the world, I mean, which, which was, was really done. You know, they, they had the right recipe to make a, to make a nice acoustics. Wow. So it's like, and, it's like yeah. when you move into a studio and you're like, it's just everything's perfect. You know what I mean? Like it might yeah. even be an accident. Yeah. Like you go into a room and you go, wow, this sounds good. Or... Yeah. You know, wow, this sounds horrible. Okay, so a big cement square room, maybe not great for acoustics, <laughs> right? Like you kind of learn that. So that's that's really yeah. cool. Yeah, and and um, one of the particular thing about the, this theater is that the spacing of the bench had really some effect in the propagation of waves, of the in, in the integration of in the interaction of sound waves with with uh, with uh, matter, you know, and and this constituted a. Uh, uh, a high pass filter actually hmm. and, and now you know it's still being researched but we think that that the, the this this effect uh, uh, would lead to to the to the good clarity because it would remove the low frequency to to mid low rumbling of uh, probably the wind around or the background noise 
Wow. So the signal to noise ratio was really good, you know, naturally. Yeah. And what's really, really even more um, puzzling uh, and, and amazing is that today in the automotive industry and the space industry and, and all the places where we want to do uh, noise and vibration control, we are now considering uh, very new materials. It's still, still in the labs. It's not really out now, but uh, we call those mat mat materials uh, meta materials or architecture architectured materials hmm. uh, which have uh, the, the particularity of being very light for the amount of of sound reduction that they can bring and wow. they show acoustic property that they should not have really naturally you know the, hence the term meta materials but it's it's really about the uh, their special organization the way that the patterns that that could be in some in some material that's going to lead to to uh to very uh, interesting characteristics for 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 noise and yeah. that's you know from the bench spacing like uh, uh 25 centuries ago so it's and it's, so uh, when we're yeah. talking bench well first off so when people hear a high pass that's also known as a low cut so if anyone's yeah. not as you know hip to the terms that basically means you're you're cutting off, uh, like Thomas said, you're cutting off all the low frequencies. So you can almost, like in, in audio engineering, it's kind of, if you have seen EQ, it's like a uh, you roll off all of these frequencies where there's particular frequencies that are just like, uh, they're very rumbly, like you said. Um, mm -hmm. Like there's certain things that you just, they're like almost inaudible below a certain frequency. Um, but like like there's there's also ones where, you know that like like for me with voice stuff i always cut a little at 200 hertz like it's just there's particular things and then on another thought is uh that you said vibrations too where you think about like someone who has a subwoofer in their trunk which i don't know if many people in france have are driving around with subwoofers yeah. they probably are but yeah. about how half the time though you hear just their license plate vibrating or you hear their their trunk shaking where it's that principle of like you don't want to hear the room shaking in, in a theater. You want to eliminate all those vibrations, um, which is kind of a less eloquent way of saying what you're, <laughs> what you're saying. But yeah, now my question yeah. is, is the bench placement, you're obviously talking about the benches where people sit to listen to the performance, correct? Yeah, absolutely. Okay. Just making sure. Got it. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And uh, uh, the principle of those metal materials is just to, to organize the matter so that they, they interact with the, the the organization of waves in in a very particular way, you know. So so having benches spaced at particular pace is going to 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 uh, impede very much some wavelength, and in the end you'll get this uh, this filtering effect. So all the as you said, all the the rumbling, all the the you can imagine in in a in an open air uh, Greek theater. Uh, or the maybe wind around or whatever background is coming uh, inside the theater is 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 kind of removed and and, and you hear the voice of the actors with uh, with uh, clarity. Hmm. And it's kind of neat too to think this is three thousand BC, right? This is like yeah, you're kind of like it's it's sort of to me like okay, they're starting to take the like entertainment. I'm sure they always have, but like it's like it's creating the new industry of like. Um, actually taking acoustics serious and building theaters and getting in that mindset. And I'm sure, I mean, really it's kind of funny, but like, it's like the beginning of like, like roadies and stuff, I'm sure. And like, like techs were like, you know, getting better at like setting things up properly and, and stage hands. So it's sort of like really early on them creating these, uh, these spaces and creating that entertainment industry in a way. Yeah. Yeah, it, cool. it, it, so they, they 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 understood that it was good for the for the performance for the intelligibility. So so they they, they copied the the formula uh, around, you know, and and uh, uh, I think then nothing much happened for 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 the for the next centuries. And and in, in my knowledge, the only the first room that was built uh, for 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 acoustics in the let's say more recent or modern world. Was probably the the auditorium in Chicago, you know, hmm. uh, nineteen hundred, uh, with uh, Sullivan was the, was the archi uh, architect, and hmm. the, and the he designed the room. He took care of the acoustics of the room, you know. He, he made some some special device, but before that, nothing much happened, you know. Wow, that's a long time. I mean, <laughs> yeah, that is, yeah, 
That is yeah, very and, and and you know from 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 this date, uh, 300 BC to the uh, Enlightenment century, so 17th, 18th uh, century, there was of course musical activity and musical instrument crafting and development of musical instrument. But the scientific interest for acoustics was lower than other other eras of science. Mm-hmm. And uh, when it comes to sensorial um, analysis or, 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 or sciences, the, 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 the king was sight, you know, so, so the, the, the scientific effort were primarily oriented to sight, to understand how an eye would work. And, and uh, uh, you had at the time numerous progresses that were done in optics mm-hmm. uh, with the development of telescopes and microscopes and lenses and everything that were pulled by the needs of the astronomy and biology. And, and uh, so, as I said, even medical sciences, we, we, the, the, the doctors knew better about the eye uh, than they knew uh, about the ear for a long time, you know. And this was just the, the way we are built. We, we think that, that uh, our, our major sense is, is, is sight. Mm-hmm. Sure. Yeah, I think back to... Um... God, it must have been a movie, or I can't remember, which I hope was historically correct, but it was, uh, and I have no idea what movie it was, but almost like someone, I, I think it was like a uh, medieval like um, hearing aid, where it was like a guy who was holding like a, a horn up to his mm-hmm. ear to amplify mm-hmm. the sound, um, and it went down, and he kind of curl, curled, and then he could hold it up next to his ear, and mm-hmm. I can't remember what movie it was, but um, it's just, that's an interesting, you know, the the theory of, and it's almost like, if you put your hands behind your ears and kind of cup around them, it actually makes it easier to hear things, <laughs> you know? So yeah, I'm yeah. sure people kind of learned that over, uh, over time. Now, how does the, you know, like the famous globe theater, like the, you know, Shakespeare's globe theater, that is interesting. And just the theory of all of this, where again, you got to put it into perspective, right? Where people are sitting there watching a performance and there's no, obviously there's no electricity, I mean, you probably wouldn't know this because you weren't alive, you know, yeah, that long ago. But wh- how crisp, how clear would it have been to hear someone like talking if you're, you know, fifty rows up in in the ch- in the the cheap seats? Like, how good was it? I guess it it was, uh, you know, good enough so that so that uh, people still are still talking about about authors uh, sure. t- today but uh, but i guess uh, coming to room acoustics it it's, it has been empirical for a long time you know just like the greeks copied the things that work it was really a, a, a try and error uh, uh, approach because it's it's a bit like like in in musical instrument crafting you know what is good of course when it comes to room you could say uh, I can measure the background noise. I can measure the reverberation time, and I I can monitor that because I don't want some 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 echo to be to be too strong, mm-hmm. um, and that's that's kind of objective uh, values that you can get. But but what what is what is right in this world does not really exist because you know you've got this kind of. Uh, uh, magical thing of a particular room that gives uh, the the right sound and and uh, i'm not saying that we don't know why but but uh, yeah. it certainly was not designed for this initially it just it just happened it just happened sure and i'm i'm sure that and maybe this is a whole you know part of the conversation too is but like uh but self mixing like saying okay you know, guy playing timpani or drummer of some kind in these, you know, early time period, play quieter, uh, piano, you play louder, violin, you play in the middle. You know what I mean? Like, I'm sure a lot mm-hmm. of it was also like, uh, if you can't hear the singer or the, or the, you know, the actor or whatever, then you guys are playing too loud. So play softer. Um, that has to be a part of it. Yeah. Yeah. Where do we go from there? Well, the, probably the next, uh, the next, uh, st- stop is in, uh, 1600. Uh, with uh, Galileo, who uh, formulated the concept of resonance, you know, and, and for I know that for musicians, resonance means a lot of things. It, 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 it's uh, it's it's it can be uh, the the lingering of a, of a particular uh, note or or a, a particular feeling about an instrument. But uh, in physics, it's really the phenomenon where you have the the energy of a system that is oscillating. 
between the deformation of something, say uh, the tension in a string, and the motion of this uh, of the string. And, and so uh, uh, Galileo uh, used strings and, and, and formulated, you know, the, the fact that at certain frequency there would be some particular uh, uh, motion or some pa- pa- particular behavior of of, uh, of uh, string structures. Hmm. And then a few lo- a few years later, Mersenne. Uh, established uh, that the sound intensity would decrease with the square with the, the, the square of the distance. So this is really really in the in the wave uh, fields of uh, of physics. And he made the first estimates of of speed of sound. So we are around sixteen hundred, and um, and then Mersenne uh, really uh, formulated the equation of uh, vibrating strings. So mm. it's it's probably a, a bit a bit too too detailed, but but. At this time, to me, acoustics made a step in the world of physics and fundamental mathematics. And Got it. this is really the start of, of acoustical engineering because it means now that we have some design parameters such as uh, string construction and tension that are related to pitch. And we have a mathematical backup for that so we understand how it works. We understand that a string with more tension is going to have a higher pitch, and we understand a, a, a string with a higher uh, uh, mass is going to have a lower pitch. You know, those kind of stuff. Sure. So, like, obviously, like, a bass has thick, longer strings, and yeah. a ukulele has thinner, higher strings. So there's... Yeah. Um, got it. So, to kind of clarify then, so from... 3000 BC up until the theater in Chicago, we're talking there, that's like the room treatment acoustics. But then when you get to 1600 with Galileo, that's more of like acoustic, like like you said, pitch uh, yeah. jumps forward with that. Okay, um, that's yeah. fascinating. Now, obviously, drum history, are drums involved in this kind of thought at all? Or is this still very much string theory? <laughs> For sure, drums were played at the time, you know, there, there were some some drums were, have been played, you know, since the beginning of of uh, of mankind, but but uh, um, uh, if if we if we want to to if Galileo would have worked on a drum, um, he would have found he would have found that that the uh, uh, the, the the membranes show resonances as well, you know. Yeah, A- and uh, what's probably uh, more difficult to to grasp is that the surrounding air with a membrane, which is such a large vibrating surface is, 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 is interacting very much as well, you know? Um, and, and I'll make a, a, a probably a, a parallel with, with, a, with a automotive engineering for, for noise and vibration. When you want to understand what are the, the, the cavity modes, which, which are, or like in a room, you know, the, the standing waves or the, the, the 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 booming uh, mm-hmm. uh, effect in, in in a room, uh, you have to understand what what we call the, the cavity mode. Okay, so sure. so um, if you do that in a, in a in a in a room, then the, you can assume that the the walls are rigid and they are not moving when you have a, 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 a standing wave inside the inside the room. When you do that into a into an automotive vehicle, for example. This is not true anymore, and it's the same for drums. So sorry for the, for the long. Uh, uh, oh yeah, it's interesting. Go, go around, but but uh, but uh, um, often you hear people talking about the fact that you have the the, the normal modes of the of the membrane. Uh, then you have the response of the cavity with with a, a kind of uh, of my of uh, of uh, image of uh, of uh, the larger the 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 volume, then the lower the the, the resonance. And they think about this in a, in a in a sequential way, but actually you cannot do that because in drums, the motion of the head and the motion of the air around the head are very very strongly coupled, mm-hmm. and it, it leads to a, a fairly complex uh, uh, problem that that Galileo at the time could not have solved. He, he didn't have the the the, uh, the right uh, uh, mathematical tool and the, and, and the not to mention any any measurement device to to understand understand this, you know. Yeah, man, I th- I think I get it. I mean, it's it's that is sort of a that's some some next level stuff there. But like, so the cavity is like like the the space, correct? Like yeah, like the actual space, like a cavity, like an opening. Um, okay, well, 
Uh, interesting. I'm going to try and let that set in here. But uh, okay, so so 1600. So Galileo, obviously, and I, I feel like, you know, drums were drums. Like, I, I think it was more of a, a lot of times in history, it's more string related, you know, piano and yeah. organ and harpsichord yeah. and all that. They're not as much worried about the drums. Yes. And one of the reason, I think there are two, two reasons. One of the reason is that when you, when you build an instrument that has a definite pitch, like a, a horn or, or a string instrument, you can have a quality uh, um, reference for it. You can say, I want the A to be 440 hertz. Exactly. You know, mm -hmm. uh, it's not the case for drums. You, you cannot, you cannot say drums should be, you know, uh, this, this, it, it has, it has not a, a really definitive pitch unless sure. you talk about timpani and tabla, which are two, to my knowledge, the two uh, head uh, or, or membrane, uh, membrane instruments that, that show a really uh, a, a strong sense of pitch. And mind you, the, the reason for which a timpani can produce a note with four to five harmonics or partials mm. that yeah. are exactly in relation with the other is precisely because there's a strong coupling between the, the air in the cavity and the motion of the membrane. If you take a membrane in vacuo, which is fairly often the kind of, of, uh, of data that are shown when we talk about drums acoustics. You know, you, you have those normal modes on the membrane with circles and, and like pie charts of, of, of where the, the membrane is moving. Those are idealized membranes results computed in vacuo without air around. When you, mm -hmm. you add the air, everything changes. And it changes so much that uh, um, a, a membrane which would be in harmonic, which would not show any any harmonic series, when you put it on the on the top of a, of a timpani volume, it becomes harmonic just mm. from the coupling. Uh, so, so I, I, I'm, I hope I'm clear here. I'm, I'm just no, yeah. telling you that, that the, the the it's a really a strong phenomenon that is probably um, difficult to apprehend, certainly difficult to measure, difficult to to uh, to to modelize, but it's really what's happening in a drum. Yeah, no, it's it's interesting too that you, the whole like, the thing about how the air affects it. I mean, that's just such a thing with drums and humidity and and heads and all that anyway, and how it affects it. And you know, when it's cold, that affects how long, how how far you can hear things, and uh, and and how sound travels faster and slower and hot and cold and mm -hmm. um, really interesting. It's it's difficult to understand, but then again, I guess it's. I feel like once you could if you can see it and see these charts and kind of maybe see a video of it, that would be, that'd be something cool to see. But um, anyway, yeah. okay. So yeah. yeah, carry on with the timeline here. Yeah. So, so, so uh, I was talking about, about vacuum and, and the, the effect of the air. Well, vacuum and atmospheric pre pressure was com conceptualized in uh, 1654 uh, by a, a guy named uh, Otto von Gericke. And uh, a few years later, Robert Boyle, Notice that the sound waves needed a media to travel, and this media is air. So, you know, connections started to, to be made between the, the, the sound and, and, and the presence of, of air. Mm -hmm. um, so then we, we, can, we can move to the 18th century. And uh, so the, the uh, Enlightenment age had already uh, started. And uh, although uh, acoustics are, were still considered a bit secondary, they would benefit in this century for major development. So John Shore, in 1711, built the first uh, tuning fork, which meant that now we have a, a worldwide reference for pitch, you know, a, a system for pitch, hmm. and, and that would be exactly the same everywhere. Uh, and, and by the end of this century, uh, Chalny, a German uh, acoustician, demonstrated with, uh, with uh, his uh, patterns, uh, which are amazing illustration of the secret geometry of sound in structure. I don't know, Bart, if, if you already saw the, those experiments with vibrating pa uh, plates on which uh, you would put uh, some kind of sand or very light material, and at particular frequency, the, 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 the sand or the dust would, would migrate to, to the areas where there's uh, no motion or minimal motion. Yeah, and those are areas... That, you, you've seen that? I've seen it where they lay like a piece of glass over like a speaker and then the, with sand and it'll form like, uh, you'll see the waves and, and um, it's, in, I didn't know that went back that, that far. Yeah. 
Yeah, I, actually, he he worked on violin, and he demonstrated that some uh, uh, some modes we call those those uh, 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 simple motion or the, the motion that are leading to those patterns we call them modes mm. uh, where uh, we're contributing to, to contributing to the sound of, of uh, violins and um, modal analysis had not started at, at, at this time it's it's a it's a mathematical tool that we in, no, in noise and vibration we use very much to understand the, the vibration of structure and and the response of of, of, of cavities and in the drum business in my in my knowledge uh, you got brands like uh, noble and Kule in the US and mm-hmm. uh, uh, Yamaha uh, that have been uh, claiming to attach their bracket at nodal point if you if you are familiar with that, if you remember this yeah uh, it's okay so so this is really about uh, uh, making a charny pattern on a on a on a um, on a shell and finding the place where there is no motion and then you say okay I'm going to 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 attach some mass or some some device at this location so I'm sure I'm not going to impede the vibration of this particular mode you know so a nodal point is a point on the shell where they have discovered that this point has no there's no vibration or minimal right. vibration at right. this point and yeah. that's where they attach the hardware yeah yeah, this this is a well. Of course, you you can still uh, you know um, uh, a single mode is never you you cannot uh, you cannot have a structure vibrating along a single mode. Uh, it's 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 mathematically Im- impossible. You still uh, you always have to, yeah. to to get what we call residues of of all the other modes of the infinity of modes of, of the structure that that are that are in play. But you know, in in particular uh, situation. Uh, if there's a frequency that you want absolutely to keep in the in the in the sound production, then you want to make sure that you're not impeding this this frequency frequency generation by putting the the uh, the um, uh, some mass or some stiffness or anything at at the anti anti node, which is the 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 the, the, the place where you've got maximal motion. You know? And that has led to you know development of drums um, that that have minimal like free floating drums um where there's like you know there's minimal uh or like the pv drums and uh and we're going to talk about your drum brand repercussion later on but um where it's it, it actually focuses on that and um and that that hunt for the you know um touching the drum as little as possible like the rims mount systems and things like that that just don't impede the the um vibrations so um wow. yeah Cool. Uh, absolutely. You know, you, you, as a percussion instrument, the, the 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 kind of signal input we we, we put in a drum is is a, something that contains a, a wide frequency range. You know, a, a hit of a, a hit of a stick or a mallet uh, uh, can 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 have a is very rich in terms of of, a, of frequency range. So all the modes uh, or many modes are going to 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 get in play to in the construction of the of the sound. So saying okay. I, I've been I've been uh, uh, taking care of one particular mode can make sense, you know. But but what about all, all the others? But it's it's uh, it's interesting to see that some companies are are are, are uh, uh, getting acquainted or or are interested in 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 this kind of analysis. And then we we can move to to the 19th century because really um, major developments for the modern acoustics took place uh, in that century, which is so. Not 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 that far away. First of all, we have um, uh, Joseph Fourier, who developed the Fourier transform. Uh, are you are you familiar with that, Bart? I don't think so. Okay, uh, actually, I, I'm sure that that you and many of the of the people that are listening to 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 us have some 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 sense of it because you already have looked at an, an EQ on on a on a. A chart of EQ of, of of a particular signal, signal, yeah. right? What is so it again? This, here, say what it is again, real quick. Oh, the Fourier transform is is yeah. a yeah. is a mathematical transformation from a time signal. So you like a, if you take a sound signal, you've got a sound pressure, for example, that is oscillating about a, 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 an average value, and, and 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 you take this time signal and you transform it into a, um, a graph. That is the amplitude of each 
of the fre- of different frequency components. So you you, you have frequency as a, a x axis, and you've got the amplitude as a y axis, and we call the, this chart a spectrum. Mm-hmm. Okay, and so so when you do an EQ, you want to look at the at the frequency mm-hmm. component of the signal, and the frequency component uh, uh, are are computed through this Fourier transform. So. Is it basically then going to tell you where you're having like a buildup of too many frequent of like, like it's too dense in certain areas of the frequency or is it more a like amplitude thing? Because when I hear like you said sound pressure, I think of like an SPL meter, like like the sound level meter to give you like the volume of, of you know, the actual sound you're listening to, the, the mm-hmm. amplitude of it. Like what is the, what is the end result of that? That makes sense. Yeah, the, 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 if you imagine the the, the, the main the main uh, um, uh, thing that 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 uh, Fourier brought with this transform was that he could go from the time domain to the frequency domain and reverse from the frequency domain to the time domain. What what he stated is that a complex signal such as the one that we are recording now is really made of the sum. Of simple, very very simple signals, sine waves, actually, and with a mathematical tool, you can go from one to the other, and vice versa. So, so I don't know if if you imagine the the power of what that means, but but now we are able to go from time domain to frequency domain. So we you can make a recording uh, uh, of an audio signal, and you can assess the frequency content on a, on a on a on an EQ chart with it you know you can say i, I want to to boost this frequency or i want to cut this frequency because i got too much or i want to to remove some of it essentially it gave you the uh, the ability to work in the frequency domain gotcha so it's basically making it's like a graphic equalizer where you can actually see um it, and and i googled it just cuz i'm i'm like as you're talking i'm like i just wanted to like kind of look at what a time domain is and it says on one of these uh, many kind of acoustic sites a time domain graph displays the changes in a signal over a span of time mm-hmm. and a frequency domain displays how much of the signal exists within a given frequency band concerning a range of frequencies got it so it's x and y like a like a you know a graph basically time and frequency and yeah. uh okay and i should say too if anyone out there is listening and this is confusing this is confusing stuff but it's really cool just to kind of like think about it and and uh and i think thomas you're doing a great job of explaining it but i just wanted people to know that like and i mean i work in this field of like doing audio stuff and and i'm it's it's let it set in (laughs) you know for people listening it's pretty advanced stuff but i think this is fascinating so you're, you're doing a good job Thank you. It's it's a it's a it's really something that is really essential. And it, it, to to be very frank, and and after almost thirty years of noise and vibration engineering, the the the, the concept in your mind of of switching from from time domain to frequency domain, saying okay, if, if I got this kind of time signal, if I got a let's say a a pure sine wave, what would be the spectrum of it? Well, the spectrum would be just. The amplitude of that sign at that frequency of that sign, so I'll get just a line on on, on the spectrum. Hmm. And then if if I got a, a, a shock like like a, a, a strike of a, of a drum a drumstick, what kind of signal am I, I am I going to get in the time domain? Going to, to get a high force, then something that is go, going to to go down uh, immediately. What okay. would be the frequency content of that? Well, you know, you you have to to do the the, the the, the the gymnastics in your mind of, of switching from one domain to the other domain, but it's it's tricky, as you say. It's something that that you know. Why, for example, a, a, a transient signal such as a drum hit would make sense to be represented as a sum of sine, which are signals that are repetitive over time. You know. Yeah. It's now, it does. It's not intuitive. Is time domain then would then like is is that kind of like attack decay sustain release i think i have that in order um yeah yeah that is okay those are time domain uh uh uh, musical conventional uh data you know okay and then then (laughs) frequency domain is if the 30 31 band eq system uh that you 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 may use 
for, yep. for whatever reason, this you are acting in the frequency domain. You say, okay, I want to 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 low pass uh, this signal. I want to high pass this one. I want to 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 put any kind of type of filter in my EQ. You're working in the in the, in the frequency domain. Got it. I think that totally helped me. And, and people usually know this, but attack is the boom. The first hit of a is a, the first hit of something. The strike usually it's a big peak on the waveform, and then. Um, the decay is when it goes down and then sustain is how long it lasts. And then, um, uh, release release is, is obviously yeah. the kind of the, 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 and you can see that on synthesizers where it's like a quick release or a slow re- or compression. They all have that. That's that system. Um, just to kind of make sure everyone's on the same page, but yeah. All right. I'm glad I, uh, struggled my way through that, uh, <laughs> yeah. concept. Yeah. But you know what's conceptually what 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 is really important is to understand, and there's many way many areas in uh, in physics where this happens. Something that may look as complex as a waveform, like the one you're recording, is actually the sum of very simple stuff. Mm-hmm. But it's just a sum of uh, an infinite terms, an infinite infinite many sines and cosines put together, and you get to to to, to this uh, waveform. And similarly, the, the the vibration of a symbol, if you could put an accelerometer or measure the, 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 the vibration of a symbol, is going to look very erratic. You know, it's going to, to, to be very, very strange. Periodic, but you know, you, you 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 have a hard time understanding what's inside it. But it's just the sum of simple motion of of you know what I mentioned earlier with modes. Well, the, the it's it's the same principle of superposition, which which by the way. Can exist only in a given environment. It, wor- it works mo- most of the time in, in acoustics and in musical in- acoustics, but like for symbols that I just mentioned, it's not mm-hmm. always the case. Far from it, from it actually. You know, it's it, as you said, it seems already fairly complex, but it, but it's just for us drummers, <laughs> it's just the beginning. You know, we, we yeah. have to, to go even further in in the in the mechanical and mathematical description to get a grasp of what's going on. You know. Yeah, which is ironic because most people think of drummers as just you know people who just hit stuff. But there's yeah. a <laughs> there's a lot uh, more to it than that. When you try to understand what you hit and what's happening when you when when you when you hit something, then then you're you're talking about uh, uh, really really advanced stuff. Really really, it's it's sure. uh, as I mentioned earlier. You know uh, the reason for which not so many, if not no one, got got really interested in in, in the acoustics of drums. It's first of all because, I, as I just mentioned, it's complex. It's something that is really requires uh, very recent uh, techniques and and and, uh, and and models and so forth. And the second one is is uh, because we don't have a, a clear uh, a quality objective. What would be the goal, you know, for a drum? What would be what what does does a good drum mean? Yeah. In, in other words, you know. Whereas so, in 1711, the tuning fork was invented, which kind of, like you said, which standardized the, this is what we use now. Whereas yeah. with drums, that doesn't quite, I know people, I'm sure people out there listening saying like, I tune my drums to a piano, I tune to a pitch, but I think, you know what, I mean, like a violin is a violin, like that's yeah. tuned to a specific yeah. note. Um, so interesting. Yeah. And you can you can range the, or, or you can sort the quality of violin, saying this one has got a better harmonic content than the other. They have the same quality of pitch. I mean, the same. They are exactly at the same pitch, you know. But mm-hmm. one one brings uh, other kind of of uh, of, uh, of harmonics, and and it's, it's claimed to be better. Uh, so 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 that's that's another thing you can quantify. And in drums, you you, you cannot really do that. You know. Yeah. Okay. So. Um, uh second half of of 19th century was was uh, more more intense uh with people like Helmholtz uh, who developed spectral analysis with resonators he made kind of of uh, if you're familiar with with the Helmholtz uh, uh resonance i'm sure you are because actually all you have to do is empty a, a bottle of uh, of beer and blow in the in the in the neck of it and then you've got this sound you know that that, that is coming out of the sure. of the bottle when you do that actually you hit what we call a helmholtz resonance so helmholtz constructed a, a number of of uh, bottles i'm not sure it was beer at the time but whatever and and <laughs> he he tried to 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 he understood that for 
certain sound, some of the bottles will start to, 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 to resonate. And then a, a guy named Rudolf Koenig filled those bottles with flammable gas and set them on fire. And then when he played this uh, particular sound, you had the, the, the bottle or the container that was excited that showed a higher flame. So here you have the first spectrum analyzer, analog analogic uh, spectrum analyzer of history. And it was you know? fire. Yeah, it was fire. It was a height, the, 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 the height of, of a flame that would tell you, okay, it's, it's coming from this volume that is tuned to uh, 440 hertz, 40 hertz. So the note that was played was 440 hertz. Wow, man, that is yeah. so like heavy metal, you know? <laughs> yeah, well, I, actually, you'll find on, 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 uh, on YouTube uh, people playing around with propane gas in, into, uh, into cylinders with, uh, with many holes, and they would play with a, a specially prepared uh, loudspeaker. They would, they would play with a standing wave in that tube. And 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 lit on fire all the all the, the th those holes that are exit for the gas, and of course when when the the the, the sound wave uh, uh, matches some inner resonance of the tube, then the, the flame gets higher, and you get very nice patterns. There's even a guy who does who has done a two D flame uh, sound analyzer. Uh, I can't remember his name, but you, you, it's hmm. pretty awesome too. Look at this because it's going to 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 give you straight away the the, the understanding of uh, spectral analysis and 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 the and the fact that that sound waves are you know pressure waves that are added to the pressure of the gas at certain spaces at certain places and 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 uh, and uh, increasing the flow of gas you know wow I mean and I'm assuming the um the relationship then to the amount to the air in the room and they use fire obviously because it's uh very visual but then i'm yeah. sure how fire uses the relationship between fire and air you know that has to be something in there i mean wow i'm just like this is it's uh, I, i'm sure at the time it, it's it's still as i said on look on youtube because it's it's, it's fairly, fairly uh, uh very visual uh, ex and nice experiments but at the time you know when when they were Trying to understand the, the, the phenomenon of, of, of sound waves and, and, and everything, it must have been pretty amazing experiment. It's it's so that was back in in, in 18, uh, 1866. Uh, now, before we move yeah. on, can I ask you like so a yeah. like a low frequency would create like a higher flame or a wider flame or would it be a lower flame for the like for the low like, you know low to high frequencies? How would it look? Well, if you consider uh, uh, different volumes filled with gas, and you've got one, you, you, you drive to resonance one of them with a with a sound wave that that is actu actually uh, uh, putting into resonance the, the the volume, you'll find an I think an equal uh, height of flame, okay. whatever the frequency. Now, if you use a, a tube in which you have the, the 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 gas and you've got openings regular opening in the in the in the tubes uh, if there's no sound basically you'll find all the flames at the same height but as soon as you as you turn on your, your speaker and add to the gas pressure the acoustic pressure that is given by by the by the uh, the speaker this acoustic pressure is going to get organized with the standing wave in the uh, a standing wave in the tube, and you'll see min and max and very nice sign patterns of way, of of of, uh, uh, of flames uh, along the, the the holes of the tubes. So so uh, it's not so much as dependent on the frequency; it's mm. dependent on the location. I see. Yeah. Unbelievable how how early that that was uh, being developed. It's 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 wild to think of like what goes through someone's mind where they go oh man i bet fire could work but it's it seems like it's really been um progressively getting more and more and more and more uh you know they it builds on everyone is just learning more from the pre the previous generation yeah and, and and yeah it's it's just 150 years ago you know yeah. probably drums are now 120 years old mm -hmm. and and this is just just about the same uh, the same uh, uh Ballpark, uh, sure. The drum set. I mean, obviously, drum. Yeah, drum I know set. You know, yeah, drums yeah. go back. Yeah, yeah. Drum I mean, set. You're right. We all right, know. Absolutely. Yeah. 
Okay. And then, then the next event, which is a major one for all the, the, the acoustician, is uh, uh, in 1877, Lord Rayleigh uh, issued a book named The Theory of Sound. So here we, we were in a situation where the, the phenomenon of, of sound waves were mathematically described. And this was this is still a, it's a it's a major step in the understanding of of, uh, of acoustics, and uh, the story goes that that Lord Rayleigh was suffering from some fever. I can't remember what, what kind of condition he had, but he was on on a on a on a boat trip on the Nile in Egypt, and and he, you know, suffering from fevers, he got his imagination boiling, and 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 he came out. With with uh, okay saying okay gathering all what I know and what I understand about uh, about uh, uh, sound and what has has been done before I think the the wave equation for sound is this one he, and he wrote the first uh, the first wave equations and um, the same year so so we we got on one hand from a very theoretical standpoint a guy saying this is the physics of sound and the same year Thomas Edison made first recordings. So, so you know it's it's a it's a nice coincidence, and uh, that was uh, that was uh, uh, eighteen seventy seven. You know? And was that like the beeswax, like the cylinder? Yeah, um, yeah, 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 yeah. Cool. Yeah, and actually, uh, uh, twenty years before, uh, a guy named Edouard Léon de Martinville made some recordings on paper, recordings of sound on paper. But mm -hmm. unlike Edison, he was he was uh, 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 unable to replay them. But it was the first time that that we materialized the phenomenon of sound, which is invisible, into something visible. And Edison made it, you know, engraved into into the bee wax, and 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 then made the the, the replay. Which and then we have, so yeah. the the first guy who did it, which you said it very well, nicely, his name, and I'm not not going to butcher it. But so it was basically, I'm assuming, uh, sound going into a large horn that then the sound would travel down and vibrate a needle to vi visually represent the the sound correct yeah yeah Th mm. this kind of device yeah absolutely cool. Cool. so so it meant we had at the time the understanding that sound was having, was about the traveling of pressure wave inside the, inside the the air at a velocity that is known now as as a speed of sound you know this is really the, the, the global uh, finding uh, at the time. Um, and so, so we could start playing with the interaction of this pressure with, with uh, as you just mentioned, with device around, such as a membrane that would push a stylus or, you know, uh, other kind of, of a device. Mm -hmm. And uh, so this was 1877. And uh, six years after that, uh, Emile Boulanger patented the, the, the tensioning system for snare drum. That is still used today, you know, with a, with a lugs and 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 and, uh, and tension screws, and founded the duplex drum company in uh, 1900. Uh, and at the, the same time, you know, the, the modern drum kit was born. It's just you know for the sake of connecting the history with sure. the history of our instrument. You know, yeah, you got to keep it drum related. Uh, of course, <laughs> <as we laughs> always. Go. Yeah, yeah. Wow. And then then in the 19th century and and. Uh, uh, more precisely, in the second half, there was an, a, a bunch of, of uh, revolution linked to computer sciences. Really, uh, uh, frequency response function with tracking filters. So th those are, but those those are the way to understand the interaction between uh, a force on the structure, for example, and the sound uh, emitted. Uh, you know, what what what. what if if we want to to analyze that, we need to have what we call the frequency response function (FRF) between the two. How many how many decibels of sound do you get for one newton applied on this particular part of the instrument? You know, those mm. kind of, of of data. This was 1961, not really not far away. No. Then the the fast Fourier transform, which which is a, an algorithm that actually dates back from 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 Gauss, uh, probably. Uh, a century before, but at the time they didn't have any computer to to run it. Um, and sixty five was uh, experimental model analysis, and sixty eight and sixty sixty seven and sixty eight uh, real time analysis, meaning that that we would start to understand the transients, not only the you know the, the continuous signal, but the, the but the, the transients. And so and all the tools, all the tools that I used uh, uh, 
worldwide uh, today for for the analysis of of sound and, and vibration. Hmm. Which, I mean, every single thing I ever do, like for work with audio, I run through an analyzer, mm -hmm. basically because I mean, I I didn't used to when I was kind of younger in my you know audio engineering days, but basically it's how you reproduce like consistent sound like for podcasting like you don't want it to be like one is very very quiet the next one's really loud and then i mean so that's just obviously for 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 the the actual like volume which there's a bunch of ways to actually uh uh register what quote unquote volume is um mm -hmm. uh but the analyzer it's cool to know that that's so that was kind of mid you said 1960s right and yeah, on yeah when, yeah, when yeah. they could analyze cool yeah, yeah. They, 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 then you know it was all the revolution uh, pull, pulled by by the computer science and the application to structural dynamics and 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 uh, signal processing. So mm -hmm. so what you mentioned, like uh, compressor limiters and and things like that, we're, we're starting to get uh, uh, even. I wouldn't. I, I won't say better because we had analog uh, uh, system mm -hmm. and still using them. You know, but but. Uh, uh, all, all the all the the, the numerical uh, um, treatment of uh, uh, numerical pr processing of signal had had really uh, had really had a, a boost at at that time, and and at the same time the, the really numerical acoustics uh, with simulation software like software that are able to predict what's going to be the vibration of, of a given structure, saying mm -hmm. okay uh, if I make a drum head with this uh, material that has this density and this. Uh, 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 module uh, modulus of elasticity. What are going to be the, the 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 frequency response function? What are going to be the normal modes and so forth? Uh, and and uh, what's going to be the sound radiation of this membrane if it's excited by you know uh, a, a, a force at this location of this amplitude and so forth? This is what, what I'm telling. I, I'm 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 giving an example about drums, but I'm sure that nowhere, no one is making those kind of cal calculation for drums. It's it's widely known for 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 uh, aerospace and automotive and and, uh, and uh, industrial you know uh, products and sometimes sometimes uh, musical acoustics. So then that's probably because it's a hell of a lot cheaper to kind of just like produce drum heads and and I'm sure experiment with them and try them versus like so you would do that with like a car or with you know uh, you know spacecrafts where you want to just kind of like uh, run. Uh, what it would maybe what like have the computer figure it out before you spend a million dollars designing it? Absolutely, right? you know okay. it's it's a competitive world, and and uh, we need to design right first time. So we need to have the, all the tools with all the knowledge embedded so that our first design is the, is the right one. It's it's really I, important. I mean, I would be surprised if if drum companies didn't use some system like that where they can run it and and check frequencies and and you know drum head companies. Um, to develop new stuff and symbols, um, so I'm sure there's and, and and guitar everything. I'm sure there's some. It's probably not as technical as uh, you know aerospace, you know yeah. stuff. But yeah, yeah, we'll talk about that because uh, in in my mind, and to answer uh, bluntly your question, no, the, the answer is no. I, no. The, the, there, <laughs> there, there is no, uh, uh, um, to my knowledge, when, when you do a research about who makes uh, really. Uh, 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 research in, in noise and vibe in, in in the acoustics of of drums and cymbals and so forth. You'll find some stuff that are coming from from uh, uh, um, universities, really researchers. But but those guys are not related or are not uh, maybe sometimes funded. But I'm not even sure. You know, th th sure. there is there is no budget from from all the major drum companies to make anything in the in the in the noise in the field of uh, of acoustics engineering for their products, so okay. in, in my mind, uh, when they when they talk about their those drum companies and those cymbals company and head companies, when they talk about uh, R and D expenditure, I think it's really about uh, quality um, production, reduction of cost, and and but but nothing for 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 really the, the acoustic quality, which which is you know. Puzzling because we are talking about a musical instrument, you know. So, so, yeah, yeah. yeah. So, so, okay. So, there's been in, in the in the in the more recent history some some uh, encounters between manufacturers and science. It's it's been fairly scarce in history, but 
but they are, I think they are coming to, to be more and more frequent today. And one of the reasons is that, um, as I said earlier, it's objectively a very difficult subject when it comes to, to drums, you know, because you're talking from instrument design, how should, should I design a drum to a physical perception loop, especially for drum, because you, you see the instrument, you feel the instrument when you play it, and you have the sound coming out of the instrument which is uh, something that if you play the instrument, you're going to hear yourself. Probably someone five meters away is going to hear something different and the engineers mm -hmm. are going to hear something different and so forth. So, so, so saying, I'm going to engineer all that so everybody's going to be happy is, is, is very complex, if not, if not uh, uh, impossible. You know? Yeah, that's although, the classic... That's the classic, like a snare drum doesn't sound great in the room, but it sounds good in the in the you know in the control room when you're yeah. recording. Or cymbals sound really dead, but then in the other room they sound good, um, kind of yeah. thing. Absolutely, absolutely. And although you know when you when you, as you said earlier, we are just people banging on stuff, you know. But but <laughs> but uh, the, the the for drums and cymbals, the mechanics may seem sim simple. You just strike something and it makes a sound, you know. But actually, you have to, to reach pretty complex physics to, to get a, a, a start of a grasp of what's going on, really. Yeah. Um, and and uh, I think as well that, that musical instrument manufacturers, they, they don't feel the need for the, for, for, to, to go into, let's say, scientific development to, to push uh, the development of the instrument as we see it today. Uh, Again, I think they, they, are, they are doing some investment to rationalize the production, lower the cost, increase the quality. Uh, and for drums, you know, from, from history, that, that actually the, the drum set was born not from the push from manufacturer, but really the need from, from the musicians and for, for, for the music at the time. So uh, music called in the end for a hi-hat stand mm -hmm. and a, a bass drum pedal and larger symbols in jazz in the, for jazz in the 30s you know that, that larger than the manufacturer could 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 uh, could manufacture so it was ch a challenge from the music to the manufacturers at, at the time hmm. and it's interesting to think about we're we're very like we make you know drummers develop what they need you know out on the streets i guess you could say and then the the brands kind of catch up and then make what they need sort of yeah yeah, they, so, so they are kind of uh, of followers of of of, of, of the need of mm -hmm. of, of musician of, and of music, you know. Yeah. Then one of of the question you could think about is is should the musicians know about all the Fourier transform and and the model analysis and and, and the science of their instrument in the end? And to to some extent, my answer is is yes, they should because. They have to make you know the best educated choice in a very competitive environment. So, so, so they better know what what tools of the trade they need to 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 get to their to their goals. And and uh, I think as well that 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 uh, um, we should go from a situation where the music pulled the need to uh, the manufacturers or, or or innovators are bringing to to musicians some new way of of uh, expressing themselves. I think today. There's a confusion in the drum business, particularly between new and innovative, you mm -hmm. know, with a very heavy tendency to look back in history. I live in France. I can tell you that uh, uh, companies like uh, Asba mm -hmm. is, is starting up. I'm very glad with that. It's great. You know, it was a it was a great uh, a great uh, drum brand in the 70s, but actually, uh, it's just looking back in the in the rearview mirror and saying mm -hmm. we are going to just to to reborn from, from our, our ashes. And, and uh, many, many, the, the value of, of, of old brands is, is so high, you know, uh, Gretsch, Slingerland, you name it. They, 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 but in terms of, of innovation, those brands were very, very innovative at the time. I mean, when great drummers sure. made the history of our instrument, they were probably using instruments that they found very innovative at the time. Why yeah. do we have to copy them today? I mean, to copy oh, those man. instruments today. That's a we great should, point. Yeah, you know, we should we yeah. should be able to bring something as new as it was at the time. We should be able to to bring something new for 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 the drummers and for for the for the musicians. You know, yeah, we have to. Keep, yeah, that's come up in some way, shape, or form on the show uh, a bunch where it's like you know, really after 
obviously things came out where it's like, oh, now there's, uh, and I'm thinking like Tama, where it's like, now there's the gong bass drum or octobons, like things like that come out, which are um, tools to use. But like really the, the, the formation of the drum set hasn't, it hasn't changed that dramatically in, um, in a long time where, um, yeah, there is a, a tendency to look backwards and a lot of nostalgic, um, uh, feelings towards the old drum set. And I'm kind of, I mean, this is a history show, so <laughs> yeah, <laughs> like, of course yeah. I'm going, we all as drummers love our, you know, looking at trap sets and all this stuff. But, um, but you're right. I've never thought about that. That, that was all so innovative and Slingerland was pushing the envelope and using radio frequencies to make shells and, and, uh, but nowadays, I mean, there are a lot of newer brands who were pushing the envelope forward, such as, you know, yourself, but like, um, obviously there's some, some big, big, big brands who are doing it too, but, but there's still the legacy, you know, we love our, you know, oh my God, Slingerland's coming back kind of thing. And it's, uh, or Rogers is coming back. We love our legacy brands. That's, that's, that's for sure. Yeah, you know, I, I own a two old Gretsch set, and I'm not going to depart from them. You know, don't get me wrong. I'm, yeah. I'm into that, of course, uh, as well. I, I like the the, the soul of, of the, those instruments, but but uh, you know, the re what is really new for the drummers today? I think we need to keep the momentum of progress and innovation that those great people started not so long ago. You know, and and uh, well, great drums made great drummers, but great drummers will make even better drums mm -hmm. if they are given the mean to do so. And, and, uh, and in order to, to differentiate a new drum from an innovative, innovative drum, in my view, in my mind, and in my activity, it's really the, this uh, scientific approach that should bring not everything, but some new things to the table, saying, okay, we, we, we can further the, the understanding of the, of, the, of the way the instrument work and we can make new proposals. Is that better? I don't know. It's just new. It's for the, the, the artist to choose, you know? To me, yeah. choosing an instrument is, is an artistic move. It's really, okay, I'm going to select this snare because I want this sound, and this is a way I want to express myself in this context. It's, yeah. you know, and, and we have to widen as much as possible the, 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 the array of, of possibility for artists. They should not be, artists should not be constrained by what comes actually from a uh, uh, consideration of uh, uh, industrial production and cost control and, and so forth. Mm. Yeah, you know? absolutely. Which goes back to the saying of, you know, we create what we need and then the companies kind of follow. So, um, you know, I think it's, it's over, we're, we're overdue for some, some really new, cool, modern changes. Um, but I think, again, like I said, there's, there's companies doing it out there, which I, I do want to get to talking about your company here, but as we get close to the end here, why don't we push forward with the history of the acoustics? So we were in like 60s, 70s, outboard gear, working on all that. Where, where do we go from there to get to, to modern? Well, I, I, w I wanted to, to, to give you, uh, actually, as, as we, we got into the discussion of musical acoustics and, 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 and drums, uh, I just wanted to, to, to make a side note of what's going on today about acoustics and, and musical instruments. And I have yeah. th three examples that I, I put together. Or are coming to my to my mind, and the first one is uh, the the story of Ovation guitar. If you, I'm sure you're yeah, familiar with them. Sure. And the story is is fairly simple. You got an engineer, Charles Kaman, that is a passion has a passion for guitar, and he just asks his team of engineers that are uh, aerospace engineers to say, okay, just understand how it works. Well, make me a new guitar, make something new, you know. And the guys go engineer way. They they want to understand how it works. And they want to 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 remove what's what's uh, wrong and to enhance what's right, you know. So so, uh, and I'm not saying in the end it's 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 just the way it's better, you know. It's just the way it was done, and and um, uh, th they made something that is what I call wisely different. You mm -hmm. know, in the case of, of uh, they, they they understood the, the the role of each part and the soundboard and and the and the volume behind and, and everything and they, they created an instrument of which you know the the reputation today you know it's it's uh, I'm sure some people hate some people like but but for sure it's uh, it's it's new you know yeah with the and rounded this, back and that's interesting yeah. to the point of some people love it some people hate it so even if it's yeah. the most innovative best thing sonically someone might go no give me my Martin guitar I don't oh, care about absolutely. that weird looking new absolutely. thing. But the, the point is not to, to say 
because I made some engineering on this instrument, it's going to be better. The point is to say, because I made some engineering of the, on this instrument, I understood how it worked and I could make some wise choices and have a new proposal for you. Now, are you going to, to consider it? Are you going to, to say it's, it's good for what you, you want? That's another story. But for sure, I got something new to, to, to propose. You know? Sure. Love it. So the, the, the second example is a, is a fairly uh, infamous experiment that took place in Paris uh, under the leadership of Dr. Claudia Fritz in uh, 10 years ago. And it's, uh, you, can, you can Google it. It's the Paris double blind experiment. It's about violin. And it, I can tell you, it, this was a passionate, a passionate uh, um, subject and is still the case because what uh, Claudia Fritz did, she's, she's a, 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 an acoustical uh, expert, a doctor in, in, in acoustics. And so, so she gathered uh, um, a number of uh, Garnieri and, and Stradivari uh, uh, with all the top soloists of the world. And uh, so uh, th there was a, a list of uh, 17 uh, violins. Half of them were, you know, world-renowned legend of Stradivarius and, and, and Garnieri, and the other were modern production of, of uh, today's makers. Mm -hmm. And in the end of the uh, so 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 the top soloist would play all the, those violins in various environments. He would listen to the other. You know, there was all crossed in in in, in all the in other ways. And it it was a double blind experiment, meaning that that the the soloist that would play a Stradivarius did not know, could not mm -hmm. see that he was playing a, a Stradivarius. He could hear it, he could feel it, he could play it, and then he could listen to his peers uh, uh, playing this violin, but not knowing what it was. You know. And in the end, it just showed that actually the, those top renowned soloists, best in the world, were unable to make the difference just wow. from a sound standpoint between uh, uh, Stradivarius and modern production. That's amazing. So I can tell you, I, I think uh, Claudia Fritz uh, is going to have a hard time uh, uh, walking in, 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 in shops where they sell, where, or in places where they are uh, Stradivarius today because it's, yeah. it's been so passionate. Uh, uh, subject, but but really, what I think what's interesting is that you know, modern manufacturers of, of violins do not do not not have to to uh, to live in the shadow of those huge uh, mythical brands such as Stradivarius. Sure. You know, so, so it, to me, from from a, from a, even from a business standpoint, it's a good news. It, it means that that they. they those guys are, are, are making violin at the best of their art, and it's the same as 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 the worldwide reference. So so it's 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 a it's a good result. It's, it's yeah. at least it's a very interesting result. And the latest example I want it's more modern, it's more recent. It's uh, I, I'm, I'm st it's still French. I'm sorry, it's it's very it's very French stuff, but uh, <laughs> very interesting company that I I met across the, the acoustical the acoustic labs where I used to to work. Uh, that company is named Sios, and it's, it means shape your own sound. And those guys are 3D printing some saxophone and uh, clarinet mouthpiece with uh, uh, the, the, the sound tailoring in mind, meaning that hmm. you play saxophone, you want this kind of sound, you just fill in on their website the, the, the kind of sound you're looking for, bright, dull, uh, I, I I don't know. I'm not a saxophonist, but you get sure. a number of of, of, descript of descriptors, yeah. and in the end, this actually would would would, would set a, a, a CAD program to modify the the, the geometry of, of of the mouthpiece, three D print it, print it, and send it to you, and mm. and and it's amazing. I mean, and it's all based on the understanding the the the, the, the people that have uh, uh, made this company are are specialists in in. Uh, in acoustics and particularly in in, in uh, saxophone acoustics, and it's uh, it's great. I mean, it's it's uh, it's really a, a, a nice gathering between uh, uh, modern technique, three D printing, understanding of acoustics, and and uh, and musical instruments. Yeah, and that seems like it could transfer over to the drums in yep. some way. I mean, you know, where it's design your. You know, 3D printers aren't going away, and I know that people have 3D printed drums, and that's kind of a popular thing. But um, it's 3D printing is not going anywhere. I know my dad, who's you know 59, 3D printed at a library a little 
piece to fix a uh, antique shelf that m was missing like a little very specific washer. He just sent, took the old one in, measured it, put it in, boom, it fits perfectly and it, it worked no problem. So when you know that your you know, almost 60 year old dad can do it, it's pretty popular. <laughs> so yeah, it's, yeah, yeah. It's funny. But, so, so it, you know, it works today for, for, for a saxophone uh, and mouthpiece. For drums, uh, yeah, it, probably th things are going to come up because uh, you, can, you can make very intricate shapes, and 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 uh, the the question is, of course, what kind of material are you going to to be able to print? And you know, there, there's all the metal printing uh, stuff that is coming up with with parts that are, are actually uh, uh, structurally good. Uh, yeah. uh, th there's a, a German guy who 3D printed a, a whole. Uh, jet engine you know for for a for a, a model plane and it works so so you can make structural parts now oh my god i love that those three are <laughs> those are great examples and I, I mean it's every single one is is very uh it, it fits to drums where you think that it sounds a certain way because it's old and the, i love the like blind taste test stuff with that but um okay so for the for the sake of keeping the episode you know in in yeah. some timely uh manner let's let's wrap up here and i want to hear about so first off, tell people about your company, Repercussion, and then um, which is sound tailoring is kind of your big thing, yeah. and where they can find you, and we'll we'll go we'll call it up a day after that. Okay, so um, uh, I founded uh, Re Repercussion four years ago, and it all started with the consideration on the interaction of air with the vibration of, uh, of the head. You know, as I said before, it's essential for the sound of timpani. So I say, why not for the snare drum and the other drums? You know. And and what is the role of venting? What what's re really going on? You see, tons of people are testing a lot of, of shapes and, and and openings, and uh, as well some research of the of of, of a symmetry in the instrument. And and this led to a really innovative design that I patented that that allow that are today allowing me to provide drummers with uh, what I call sound tailored snares, meaning. Uh, Beyond changing the head tension, the head types, or the snare wires, I can really change the the, the sound of the instrument through um, the 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 shells and the and the aperture and the characteristics of the of the vent and everything. So so because you you have to have in mind that in a drum, ninety percent of the sound is made by the head and the way the head vibrates, and the way mm -hmm. the head vibrates is very much influenced by the behavior of of the what I call the acoustic circuit. Meaning the the volume of the air. All the drummers know that the dimension, diameter, and depth uh, are are a major uh, uh, player on the on the drum sound. Yeah. But you have uh, other ways of of uh, of tackling this, uh, or you know, introducing some new independent parameters of that. And this is what I've done in, in tuning the acoustic circuit. I start to to build the sound that is that is uh, needed by by some particular drummer. And then, uh, then uh, I have a selection of shells that I mix and match. So I, I make hybrid shells, uh, hybrid drums with a uh, um, metal and wood and acrylic, acry wh whatever is needed really for the for the for the sound. And uh, 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 so now I'm, I have developed a, a number of, of uh, snare drums and tested them. I measure the frequency response function of, of all my of all of my of my shells to 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 know where I'm I'm going. And I just uh, just uh, developed uh, uh, two full drum kits using the same system that that sound really awesome, really really. I'm blown away by by the sound of the of the drums. So there's awesome. further development to to come. Always uh, 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 with a lot of uh, of, uh, of innovation. I'm thinking a lot about uh, hybrid electronic acoustic drums, uh, which would be actually a phase two of what I've done. Uh, Ten years ago, in in the past, uh, for for electronic drums. So yeah, th there's a lot of of things that are that are coming uh, coming up, and uh, all all this uh, this work has has been uh, has been um, developed after hours in in a lab, and made prototypes, made calculation, and you know, really engineers the the, the, the drum. So, yeah. and you know, it's not about. In the end, it's not about developing a scientifically wise technology because it doesn't mean anything in, in the artistic uh, world. As I said before, it's about proposing the new field of possibilities to artists. Uh, and as I said, it's very important to me. All the, the development of repercussion, it started day one 
I made my first prototype and I went to, to the, to the uh, uh, auditorium uh, with classical percussionists. And I said, look, I got this new kind of drum. What do you think? I went to those guys because I know they are very, very um, attentive to sound, you know? Uh, and, and so, so, so uh, I, I always have the, the, the feedback. I'm always working and al always developing with, with uh, some short feedback look of, of artist playing. It's just not me going around with scientific, scientific stuff that would lead to nowhere. It's yeah. really about, you know, getting the feedback of, of people. And I have, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm fortunate enough and very happy to have the feedback of, of a renowned, world renowned uh, artist, uh, uh, testing and using my, my drums and are very happy with that. Well, that's just awesome. I mean, it's, it's, um, it's like you said with Ovation guitars, we were like, well, like mathematically and scientifically, it's perfect. But someone might say, I don't like it. <laughs> so yeah, of course. It's good of course. Because like you can be in as a lab as much as you want. But like, like you said, it's good that you're actually getting drummers feedback and, and they're beautiful drums with a very unique, obvious uh, system. If you, if, if you guys out there listening, go to repercussion, R-E-P-E-R-C-U-S-S-I-O-N, repercussion.fr. Um, you can see them um, and see this really cool technology um, that Thomas has been doing. Um, and God, what I love about it though is just that obviously you're a uh, dare I say brilliant guy with with all of this understanding. But um, y it, it's cool that a guy like you is out there making this stuff to push forward the development of the drums for a number of reasons, you know, to be, because it, it, it needs to, we need to move forward and, and there's nothing wrong with what's going on now, but I think it's great that someone like you is using, you're using your powers for good and not evil <laughs> and you're, <laughs> you're, you're using it for drums. Thank you very much, Bart. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Well, thank you for coming on the show. And, uh, it's so cool. You're, you're my first, uh, you're my first French guest. So from what I, from what I hear, there's, there's a lot of cool stuff going on in France with, um, uh, acoustics and experiments and all kinds of cool stuff. So I'll have to get some more, some more French folks on the show. But, uh, on that note, everyone can go to repercussion.fr, check out what Thomas is doing. Um, so Thomas, thanks for being on the show, my friend. Well, thanks for having me, Bot. If you like this podcast, find me on social media at drum history, and please share rate and leave a review and let me know topics that you would like to learn about in the future until next time. Keep on learning. This is a Gwyn Sound Podcast. <laughs>